It is a profound honor to once again welcome back to our show, legendary forecaster, Martin Armstrong. Go to his website by going to armstrongeconomics.com. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's the first thing I look at in the morning. Martin, welcome back to our show. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And I just want to point out that Martin wrote this phenomenal book, The Plot to Seize Russia. If you read it, you'll have a lot of clear insights about what's going on. And one of the first things, I mean, every time we, we talk, it, it feels like years worth of history happened between this period of time. And right now we're kind of in a cold political theater. You have the Republicans and Democrats, they're all talking about this debt ceiling. And it seems to be this thing where it's all theater. Oh, and at the last minute, they decide to borrow more money and print more money. So I'm curious from your perspective, do you believe or see that the U.S. is already defaulting on its debts because it's printing too much money that even if we repay this debt, it would repay it back in money that is not worth what it was worth, you know, even 10 months ago? Well, it's it's not a default. A sovereign default is when they actually say, that's it, we're never going to pay again. Uh, what we're looking at is effectively the collapse of really Keynesian economics. Since World War II, the problem that has emerged is that politicians, when Keynes said you could run a deficit to help stimulate demand in a recession and depression, so he did never advocated perpetual <laughs> deficits that never end. And so they go, oh, well, he said we could do it. Well, under certain conditions. He also said you could lower taxes to stimulate, but they don't do that either. So effectively, we're looking at Keynesian economics itself, the whole system of how they've been managing government, since World War II is collapsing. That's what's really at fault here. It's not just the United States. I mean, most of the other countries are actually far worse than the United States. We at least have the largest economy. And that's what has really sustained it, in all honesty. But Europe is, is it's just crumbling apart. You know, Europe has been more on the socialistic Marxist side of just about everything, you know, and, um, you know, the biggest problem with that is that we're starting to see some of it here, oh, equality, income disparities, you know, these are all Marxist, you know, ideas and theories. And the problem with it, why that ends up collapsing economies is that we're not, you know, we're equal in rights, but not in talent. Somebody can throw a, a football better than I could. So should I be a quarterback? You know, I said, oh, it's not fair. You know, you're not picking me. I mean, that's absurd. But the real essence of communism and why it collapsed was that by this making everybody equal, you then terminate all imagination. You know, someone says, gee, I have an idea. Maybe I could, I could invent this. All right. If you have no freedom to even think or innovate on anything, that's what causes it to collapse. I mean, there was the famous, you know, Nixon Khrushchev confrontation in, in the American kitchen. And he's showing them all, you know, how our lifestyle has increased. And, you know, I mean, we had hired a, um, a Russian girl as a programmer years ago. And the funniest thing was, she says, I don't know how to shop. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, when I go to the store, you have like 20 different brands of toilet paper. I got to make a decision on everything. Mm -hmm. She said, and over there, we just have one. There was no uh -huh. distinction. <laughs> so it's very interesting, that the, the contrast between the two. There's a gentleman, Tom DiLorenzo, wrote this book called The Problem of Socialism. And Martin, I really love this book because it simplified a lot of these lessons. And it, one of the biggest takeaways I had from it is that on top of people, you said, losing all imagination, he said they don't have any incentive to produce. So it's they get kind of this idea of communism is this idea that people are going to 
willingly produce, even though whether they work hard or work less, they're not going to improve their lifestyle at all. So it, it doesn't have people aren't motivated to produce. And it seems that in this system that the state claims to have a right to everyone's goods. And I was at this conference. I was at the, actually, I went to a town hall meeting because they wanted to raise property taxes again, like for the eighth time in 10 years. And all I saw were people that I don't know if they were working or not, but they seemed to, to know what they wanted to do with other people's money and wealth. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's just terrible that we're getting to that point. So uh, I was in Vancouver and I actually heard, I don't remember her name, but she was one of these leftist politicians up there. And she actually went as far as to say, whatever you earn is the government's and they decide what you're allowed to keep. It was like, uh, it was unbelievable. But I mean, you, you, you have to have that incentive. If, if somebody doesn't say, gee, I could, you know, maybe make, make something like this or whatever. And I mean, look at Henry Ford. If he didn't create the, the assembly line, how many millions of jobs that would never have been created? Um, it cars to help people leave the, the, the cities and, and, you know, real estate booms outside in the suburbs were, were then suddenly you know, possible. Uh, so you have to understand that, you know, then they go, oh, look how much money he made. That's not fair. You know, it, look, you know, you come up with an idea and you'll make it just as much, you know. I understand that. I understand that. But people like they get upset that other people have money. I think it's fantastic. It's, if somebody can do it, then you can do it. I don't understand why people aren't inspired. I don't know. I I, I find it curious that. In the Ten Commandments, it actually forbids socialism. It says, thou shalt not cover thy neighbors, you know, wife, goods, etc." So for that to be in there, obviously there were problems in ancient times with the same type of theory. Otherwise, it would never have been included. You know, you find the same things in, in Roman law and even in Babylon, uh, the first wage and price controls were by Hammurabi. I mean, that's his legal code. This will be the price for this. This will be the price for that. Wages, etc. It's it's fascinating how these boom and bust cycles have always existed. I mean, since the very beginning, and most people don't even realize. But like, there are Babylonian clay tablets which have survived showing there was a futures market you know oh. a farmer is going to plant you know his crop and he wants to make sure he's going to be able to you know, to sell it you know what if he puts in all that labor and all of a sudden he can't sell it so there were futures contracts and he would sell his crop before you know at the time of planting mm -hmm. it's very fascinating when you look at a lot of the you know economic and historical texts you can see it's the same thing over and over and over again. Well, because you study and you're so amazing when it comes to spotting patterns, I found one story very interesting on your site. It's about how Africa's uh, attempt, their test run for CBDs, uh, central bank digital currencies failed. Apparently they had 90% of the country previously used cash for transactions. So this is leading up to a part question where it says, according to the FDIC, there's about about 6 million people in the U.S. that don't even bank. So what's going through my mind is basically what you just said about socialism. If people don't have any incentive whatsoever to produce because of under socialism and they're not inclined to do that, how would they be able to implement a central bank digital currency if they're basing on the fact that, okay, well, we're going to use this based on everyone participating? Do you look at the failure of the central bank digital currencies in Africa as a hope for the future that it will not succeed on a larger scale, because even on a scale where they tried it, where they thought they were going to have the ultimate power and the ultimate playground, that it failed. Does that give you um, any kind of hope? And do you think that the, that failure is directly tied to the natural rejection of a controlled economy where people have no incentive to produce? Well, that's part of it. But you also have a situation for the life of me that you certainly should never create a, a a digital currency i mean because the first thing you do i mean just look at what we you know we did when we went into iraq 
the first thing you do in a war is you take out the power grid, you take out the communications, and you take out the water supply. That's the first three targets you, you do. So if we were all on electronic currencies and they took down just the power grid, the entire country would absolutely collapse. I mean, I don't understand this from a, a national securities perspective. You know, it, it just makes no sense because there's no way you can possibly guarantee that the power grid would, would never go down. It's just absurd. Yeah, even in Florida, when you guys had that major hurricane, all those people that had those electronic cars, I mean, they were, they were in a tough spot, but you had gas-powered cars. And then they're pushing for all the green energy initiatives. And I understand the intention saying, okay, let's try to utilize a power grid that is less taxing on the environment. But if it can't compete with fossil fuels at this point, and it can't even go near the efficiency, I mean, it doesn't make any sense that they would even try to do a central bank digital currency, knowing that if the grid goes down, everyone's, what are you going to do? Well, you have two things. One is that despite all the propaganda about climate change, it was instigated, it was taken to Congress by John McCain. And the whole purpose behind it was that 50% of Russia's economy was all fossil fuels. So he was pushing, oh, climate change, we have to save the climate and to go to nuclear. And it was basically to undermine Russia. And, and that was the whole gist of this whole thing starting. And then you get all these people with, you know, you know, look, the climate has always changed because there is a, a natural cycle. The sun beats like your heart. You know, I mean, you know, they forgot about ice ages. <laughs> I mean, even, you know, John Adams wrote a letter, you know, back. We were coming out of the ice age, which bottomed, the mini ice age, which bottomed in the mid 1600s. And even when the American Revolution was taking place, I mean, there are pictures of Washington crossing the Delaware with ice that's three feet thick. You know, I mean, I grew up there. I never saw the Delaware ever iced over like that. <laughs> but, you know, you had these crazy things. I mean, John Adams even wrote a letter that they couldn't even grow crops because the land was frozen two feet deep. So it's look, this has always been taking place. The migrants that moved, they called them the, the sea people in ancient times, which overthrew the, the Bronze Age, were the people from the north fleeing the climate change up there. So this has always happened. And, I mean, civilization increases and it expands during warming pe periods and it collapses during cold periods. Simple as that. And thank you. And when you have you ever run some patterns through Socrates to see what the weather patterns will be if we will be entering into a mini ice age for the foreseeable future? Has Socrates been able to garner that? Yes, kind of we're actually getting colder. We're not getting warmer. It, it's kind of you know it, it it's very concerning to me because it's during the colder periods where food production declines and disease increases. The Black Plague was in, you know, in the 14th century. That was the same problem. All right. And you also have these periods where there's major wars, international wars, and that's when disease increases. When, the, you know, uh, Attila the Hun came in and st they brought diseases from China and wiped out. I mean, even a Roman emperor died of the plague, you know, uh, several of them, actually. Uh, and they were because they were waging war with uh, people from Asia. I mean, the Black Plague actually started by the Tartars came in and was in Crimea. The Italians had a fort there and <clears throat> to get them you know, to try to, you know, basically defeat the the Italians, they were catapulting dead bodies from the plague into their fort. The Italians left, panicked, and they took the Black Plague back to Europe. And that's why in Crimea, you don't have Ukrainians there. You have Tartars and you have Russians. And they're, the Tartars are still there. They never left. It's, it's a really fascinating, and uh, I just wonder what's going to happen in the near future. And Martin, I think about this thing. I actually saw this as a meme 
but uh, said the U.S. supplied Gaddafi with weapons, then they killed him. U.S. supplied bin Laden with weapons, and they killed him. U.S. supplied Saddam Hussein with weapons, and they killed him. If you were Zelensky, would you be sleeping with one eye open knowing that this is a kind of a recurring history with the U.S. and that the U.S. maybe one day will sacrifice Zelensky if they feel that it's in their best interest to move to another phase of their operations? Zelensky is a real loose cannon. And right now, I mean, you can look at videos and he's pitching that, oh, Ukraine's going to be the best mm -hmm. investment in Europe with BlackRock committing. Them. That's all he's looking at. How much is he going to make? If he was really a national leader, I mean, would he, wouldn't you be concerned that nearly 10 million people have fled your country and they're, and they're yeah. lifting up? And, and he sees that as great because all their houses are destroyed and everything. And that's, that's great because we can get all the money from BlackRock to rebuild it. And that's all he's looking at. You know, he goes to meet with the Pope and... Pope says, you know, he'll he'll step in to try and mediate. He says, no thanks, you can't mediate. I don't want to, I don't want any help. I just want the war to keep going. I mean, this is nuts. And one of your recent articles were talking about what would happen if Putin gets taken out. Everyone's saying, oh yeah, well, Putin's got to go. Putin's got to go. And I remember reading something you said that, well, if he goes, then the hardliners are going to come back. Oh yeah. Based on what you're seeing in your projections, do you foresee the intensity of a World War III ratcheting up with Putin there or when he's out? Do you think that Putin's really maybe the only thing that could be a factor that is holding the world from largely entering into a, um, a thermonuclear war? Yes. I mean, that book that I did, The Plot you know, to Seize Russia, I was in the middle of it. All right. That was back in 1999, and they were trying to take over Russia then. And I was still the neocons and, and the bankers. And they got Yeltsin to steal $7 billion from the IMF loans and steered the wire through Bank of New York. And as soon as it went through Bank of New York, they went to the DOJ and say, oh, there's a big money laundering. All right. And I mean, I even met with the prosecutors. I said, you people don't even understand where this leads. It goes right back to Yeltsin. And they're just sitting there with their mouths open. And that's what it was. The DOJ was used as, as a pawn. And they tried blackmailing Yeltsin in July of 99. And then he turned to Putin. Why? Because Putin was neither an oligarch and he was not a hardliner. All right. That's why the people cheered. And he, because he wasn't a career politician or any of this stuff, they did not want to go back to communism. And the communists, the former communists, had filed an impeachment motion against Yeltsin on the corruption. So Yeltsin turned to Putin, and this all this propaganda, oh, Putin's evil, this, that is such nonsense. Because if that were the case, I think he would have waged war a lot sooner than now. All right. And the other people that you have to understand what's going on in Russia is that the, the hardliners know that this is really a proxy war of the United States against Russia. And even the head of Chechnya came out and said, oh, we should nuke Kiev. And it was Putin that came out and says, no, we don't want to go there. All right. Putin is more of a nostalgic historian. Kiev is where actually the first capital of Russia. They were, that's when the Mongols came in in 1240 and, and, they destroyed Kiev, and they reappeared in Moscow. You remove Putin, and I'm telling you, the, the resistance against him over there is the hardliners. And they feel that, you know, this is World War III. The U.S. Is, and NATO is coming in, and they're correct. That's what this is really all about. I mean, I've seen charts where they're dividing up Russia already. And... You remove Putin and you're going to see absolute World War III. And, I, and our, our computer is projecting that, particularly after 25. But our neocons here in the States and, you know, the FBI and everybody, look, they all colluded to make sure they got rid of Trump. Because honestly, none of this would have happened as long as Trump was there. 
He was against war, etc. I actually went down to Mar-a-Lago for dinner one time in March of 2020, and I was surprised. As you know, I've met some, you know, just about all the various different heads of state. And he was the first one I ever heard saying that he wanted to pull the troops out of Afghanistan. He said he was sick and tired of writing letters to their fathers and mothers that your son died for God and country. He says, what are they fighting for? They've been fighting over borders over there for a thousand years. He says, what difference are we going to make? And that's why he wanted to pull everybody out. And the other guy who was against war was JFK. CIA took him out. <laughs> so, you know, as soon as they got rid of basically Trump, all the neocons came back in. If you just look at it, the neocons that were they stuffed in his cabinet, he started firing them one after the other. John Bolton, for example. Yeah. I mean, you're lucky, you know, if there was a Russian in Canada, he'd advocate invading Canada. I mean, that's just the way he is. And so, unfortunately, these people are pushing uh, for war. They, I think that when Khrushchev came out and said, we will bury you, they came out the opposite way. Well, we're going to spread democracy to the world. But we don't really have democracy. You know, do we get to vote? If, should we go to war with Russia or not? No, they just do it. They pretend we're a democracy, but we're not. This is a gentleman, I heard him speak before, I read his book, his name is John Whitehead from the Rutherford Institute, and he has this really interesting quote, Martin, he says, if voting made any difference, they wouldn't let us do it. So I wonder, even if you have, say, some statewide elections or a presidential election, where you have a legitimate candidate out there that would have a different perspective on where they're pushing us towards, do you think that at this point they'll do whatever they can in order to stop that individual and even if people flat out say, well, you know, that that's cheating, that they're willing to do it, that it no longer matters to them whether or not people think it's legitimate or not. Maybe there's just enough confusion that they can throw out there that they can pretty much rig an election any way they want. Yes, I, I would say the other comparable quote was uh, Joseph Stalin. Mm -hmm. He said, you can vote whoever you want. It's the guy that counts that makes the decision. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's very true. I mean, it, look. I, our computer is even showing I don't think you're going to have a fair election in 24, any way, shape, or form. And okay. what does it say about this DeSantis and Trump? Because I'm sure people probably ask about it. I mean, it looks like DeSantis is you know, doing something certain ways in Florida. Some of the other governors are, are leading their, their states in certain ways. But is it your computer saying anything about Trump, DeSantis, or um, who will ultimately prevail in the election? Now, I haven't really looked at that, but I mean, on, honestly, I mean, I was asked if I would go talk to Trump. This was like last year, to talk him out of running in 24. And they wanted to ask me if I would go meet with DeSantis and if I would be interested in doing an advisory position. I did fly out to go meet with DeSantis mm -hmm. and I said, look, I'm, I, you're not going to I don't want to get get involved. All right. I said, you get me involved and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell DeSantis not to leave Florida. <laughs> uh, and he said, oh, why would you do that? I said, because you people are going to eat them for lunch. And that's the way it is. I mean, you have to understand the way Washington really functions. I mean, I could run for office and say, vote for me, whatever you want to hear. I'll save the whales, women's rights, abortion. Mm -hmm. whatever. I'll, I'll, I can say whatever you want to hear. All right. I get there and they go, oh, that's very nice. Glad you're here. This is how you vote. Just look at the at the votes. They're always down party line. So, I, you know, people say, oh, well, I like what he says versus this. Thing. Does it really matter? It, it doesn't. You're only voting for a Republican or a Democrat. That's it. Geez, I, I just wonder a wish. I don't know if Socrates would ever predict this in the future, but you have a group of people that just say, well, look, I don't want to infringe upon you. I want to live my life. You lived your life. You know, we can peacefully coexist. Is a civilization like that emerge in post-2032? Because you're, you're talking about World War III heading in. I know you always mentioned 2032. And I wonder, does that happen as a direct result of all these terrible things happening throughout the world where the world just grows tired and weary or we have a massive reduction in population as a result of these wars and well, people decide to decentralize? 
It's both. I mean, we're, we're going to see a, a sharp decline in, in population after 2032 anyhow. But the, what's that caused by? It looks like it's disease and war, basically. Okay. And I mean, these people with their climate change is effectively you're reducing the, you know, just look at what they're doing to farmers. I mean, mm. and, you know, you, you go to Netherlands and they want, you know, a football field and only two cows. You can't yeah. have two cows in a football field. Effectively, what they're doing is outlawing cattle, really. Because, I mean, that's why Europe always had veal, because it was, they didn't have the land to, to raise big herds of cattle. So, look, we're, we're just, the last big event like this, we overthrew monarchy. Then we went to a Republican. And hopefully the next time we now go, Look, those two don't work. Let's try actual real democracy for once. Uh, we're in a republic. We're not in a democracy. And, and republic is you basically vote for somebody and they represent you. Well, they never represent us. They represent their own self-interest. That's it. So it's republics are, are traditionally the most corrupt form of government. That's why Caesar crossed the Rubicon. <laughs> And most people don't realize that, but I mean, that was the fake news of Cicero that, oh, you know, he was a dictator. Well, so was Cicero for a year. <laughs> you know, basically, you know, when Caesar crossed the, the Rubicon, the people cheered. It was a debt crisis. He was the only one that ever understood how to resolve a debt crisis. We have a Julian calendar. Why? Because the corruption was so bad, they bribed the high priest. And he's the one that decided when to put in leap days. So they said, well, we don't want to go to elections. So here, give us a couple months. Oh, okay, fine. How much? <laughs> and and so when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, it was actually January 10th. It should have been, you know, dead winter. It was summer. All right. So it, the calendar, you know, he ended up creating the Julian calendar and was later on, you know, adjusted by Pope Gregory. But he standardized the calendars to, to eliminate that corruption. I mean, that's pretty bad when you're bribing the priest to create to, to create extra days. I mean, that's how bad it was. And the people just absolutely cheered Brutus and everybody. They, they fled. All right. If they were really supporting and, and, and the Republic was so great, why did they flee Rome? Because the people were against them. Well, I want to, you know, you have this really interesting article about the six, the cycle of rebellions of Rome and trying to draw parallels between that and the U.S. When you are looking, you're exploring these cycles of history and you're looking at where the U.S. is, do you see uh, a lot of similarities between where the Roman mentality of the Roman people were, as you just described, and where the American people are right now? And also... When we have periods of time when you said civilization or civilization to survive and thrive, everyone has to be vested and be vested. But then when it leads towards totalitarianism, then that's when it really tends to break apart. So I was curious, where do you foresee, draw a parallel between where the U.S. is now, where the Roman Empire is, and also is the U.S.'s stage of wherever they are as far as evolution or de-evolution concurrent with where the rest of the world is? Well, you have to understand that, you know, they created the EU because this theory, one government would eliminate wars. Well, there was the Roman Empire, one government, and it didn't eliminate wars. All right. That article I did was showing how many times they had civil wars. So, you know, this theory of a one world government, you know, it's just nonsense. Uh, it's just not going to eliminate anything. Typically in the United States, what will happen is the same thing with Rome. And you will find that the military will split. The country is so divided already. Yeah. Um, and just take, you know, this whole LGBTQ stuff. I mean, it's it's going beyond simply what you would say, you know, make, you know, making sure they have equal rights, et cetera. Now it's gotten to the point of promoting that on everybody else and stores and things. I mean, it's just gone too far. 
I mean, they're putting out books and, and you know, you have Target wanting a book for, for infants, basically, that there are no pronouns. I mean, this is now the parallel I see is in Rome, this is how the, the why the, the Christian persecutions began. Because the Christians wouldn't respect the religions of anybody else. So as Rome started to, to collapse and you had barbarians coming in, they blamed the Christians for, they thought that they offended the gods and the gods were punishing them. So it's, once you start that process of dividing society into groups, society no longer can exist. They, they, you know, I think, you know, Lincoln made it correct. The house divided cannot stand. And so the country will split apart and so will Europe. And with the EU, I mean, you know, when they were forming that, it was just, again, it was just crazy theories. Uh, and I was in meetings with them and I said, you don't understand what made the United States function. They said, what? I said, discrimination. What do you mean discrimination? How? I said, because whoever was the last off the boat was always discriminated against until they spoke English. <laughs> and once everybody spoke the same language, then you ask an American, what are you? Oh, I'm half German, half Irish. Well, you don't see that in Europe. I mean, there's always exceptions. But, I mean, you don't have somebody from Italy going up and marrying somebody from Scotland. I mean, they don't speak the same language. It's different cultures. Over here, we all ended up as a melting pot. So it didn't matter. I, I miss it. I miss uh, just talking to some of my classmates. I graduated almost 30 years ago. And we miss having conversations with people who, you know, we didn't share the same political values or same relig religious beliefs. But you could have a conversation. You can't do it today. It's just, just so sad. And I really appreciate your last answer, Martin. And something that just reoccurred to me based on something you said earlier about how society expands during warmer periods of time and how it tends to contract during colder periods of time. Well, if your computer you know, it says that we're going to a particular ice age, it's going to get colder. Do you find that there's any kind of parallel or a similar pattern emerging where we're seeing capital going into certain states and countries that would be least, less susceptible to an ice age that would be considered to be in a warmer area if an ice age were to come? Is that something that's just naturally occurring or do you see that happening? Not yet, but the capital is shifting already. Okay. For example, real estate is declining in Chicago and New York and California. All right, it's still rising in Texas, in um, Florida. So you have a migration uh, from the blue states to the red states within the United States already. You look at Fifth Avenue in New York City, like a third of the stores never came back. It's incredible. I mean, you you destroyed basically one of the greatest shopping streets in, in, in the world. You can't do this sort of thing. I mean, I mean, even in Europe, you ended up like the mayor of Berlin. Everybody else is rescinding their masks type stuff. And then when you're on the train, it says, okay, we're coming into Berlin. You got to put a mask on. So and then strange. When you leave Berlin, okay, you can take it off now. I mean, it's just absurd. You know, you have every little hamlet basically becoming a dictator. And it was just, you know, nonsense. The whole thing was nonsense, not based upon science or anything else. I mean, you can Google, it was in the Washington Post, masks were useless. That was the conclusion from the Spanish flu in 1918. And so, I mean, and even Fauci signed on to that. So, you know, it was all political. I'll put a mask on, just lock down. I mean, this is, it was nonsense. It seemed to be more of a, a an exercise in how much power can we really grab? Well, I wonder if they're, they're talking about another pandemic, like, well, a new one's going to come. So I wonder, uh, there was a story today in one of the major newspapers saying how, uh, World, Health, World Health Organization wants to implement global lockdowns yeah. this time, and I wonder if they will succeed in any capacity, and if people will still be scared and they'll still, you know, decide to, to lock themselves down. What do you do? You foresee anything like that happening? Does your computer foresee 
more lockdowns that'll go from, let's say, for example, COVID lockdowns, and they'll say, well, no, we're going to do climate change lockdowns. And if people will tolerate it or if they'll, uh, you know, completely ignore it. No, that's that's what's starting to be part of, of the splitting of, of United States and, and and Europe, for example. The WHO is a very dangerous organization, and so is the United Nations. You know, once they're there, they always, like any politician, they want more and more and more power. They never look at it, oh, well, I could do this if I had that. You know, it's, you know, I've been in meetings with governments for over 40 years, and we're always the scum. They wouldn't have a problem if everybody paid their taxes. You know, you hire a 16-year-old girl from next door to watch the kids while you and your wife go out. Well, where's our 50% from her? You know, I mean, this is what they, they look at. And they always exaggerate it. It's like when Christine Lagarde got a hold of the IMF, that she immediately went out and started going after these countries and saying, if you don't turn over everybody with money down there, we're going to remove, remove you from the SWIFT system. She even did that to the Vatican. I mean, this is just getting to the point. It's just give us the money. Just take it all because that's really what this is about. But in human nature, how much more does, looking at habits of human nature, how much more do people you know, have to take in order before they, they start ignoring it? Because I, I, I wonder if people can be only, if you can only give a human so much fear, make them be afraid so long before it kind of you know, loses its touch. Because, you know, towards the end of the, the COVID lockdowns, and everything, people just ignored it, I think, before they even said that you didn't have to wear a mask. A yeah. lot of people were, weren't doing a lot of that stuff. Because I f wonder if they were just exhausted, if they, they overplayed their hand. So I wonder if even like say for example, I know there are things that we need to be concerned about, but then there's some things that may necessarily be you know exaggerated, as you say, based on what you know about human nature, based on what Socrates has you know, learned about human nature. How how soon do you overplay your hand to the point where it becomes completely ineffective and you can't get people to take action on anything because they're just feared out? I, I think they have lost a lot of credibility with the COVID. Because here in Florida, our COVID was no worse than anybody else. We weren't locked down. <laughs> you were uh, right. And you you see stores with big signs, thank you, DeSantis. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I really don't want them to leave, actually. But um, look, it's you still see some people driving by themselves in a car with a mask on. I mean, I feel sorry for them because they're clearly mentally, you know, deficient there or have been terrorized to whatever degree. I mean, in Asia, you wore a mask if you were sick. Mm. It doesn't, you know, as a courtesy, maybe not to spread to other people, but you, the whole society didn't walk around with masks. It's just the way, it, you know, I don't think that, I think this play for the UN and, and the WHO, this is what tears everything apart. This is what people basically will say, enough is enough. I mean, the who you have no right to vote in, this is totalitarianism. So they will make a decision and the rest of the world must comply. How do, you know, that's not democracy. And that's not even a republic because we didn't vote for them to represent us. You know, NATO is basically uh, a terrorist organization. It was formed back during when Russia was a communist country, all right? Well, communism failed. Did they change? No. Their whole existence is predicated upon war. So they will always warmonger. They will always, because if there's no war and there's peace, guess what? We don't need NATO. So they're over there saying, oh, NATO has to be looking at Asia too. They're always expanding their power. Once you give any level of power to those, you know, in government or in agency, forget it. It's gone. They will always try to expand. Mr. Martin Armstrong, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Once again, you can learn more about Martin by going to his website at armstrongeconomics.com. And I just want to say, Martin, sometimes you talk in your articles and you say, ah, you know, I don't have much time left or I may not be here. And I just want to say uh, how thankful we are that you are here and that you are a warrior for freedom. And we talk about Memorial Day. We thank all the people that have served the country, that have been fighting for freedom. And I think about you and I think about people like Dr. Ron Paul and I think about all other people 
that have really stood against the tide and spoken up when it was not exactly the most beneficial thing for them. And I just want to say thank you so much. Well, thank you. I also have a family. I worry about them. I mean, personally, I'm ready. You know, Scotty can beat me up right now. <laughs> um, let me get out of this insanity. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Oh, Martin, thank you so much. And uh, I have to say, Cassandra is so wonderful to, to, to work with. Thank you. And uh, I wish you a blessed, wonderful weekend. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll send you a link. Thank you. Great time. Bye. Okay, everyone, that concludes today's edition of the Out of Limits of the Truth Radio Show. Special thanks to our unbelievable guests.